So let me first of all welcome everybody uh, to this um, discussion this evening. We're talking about uh, proportional representation. Maybe some people don't think it's the most exciting thing, but it is actually gaining very considerable traction within the Labour Party and the Labour movement. Um, so we, we've got two um, brilliant speakers this evening, um, and you've got me, uh, and I'm chairing this evening. Um, uh, so just a few words about myself. I'm Simon Lydiard. I'm a member of the executive committee of SME for Labour. I'm also the chair of Vauxhall Labour Party, uh, though I'm speaking in a, in a personal capacity this evening. Uh, I've been a member of the Labour Party for uh, 39 years. Obviously, I joined at six months old. Um, I'm a former Labour councillor, though that was quite a long time ago. Um, I've been a long term supporter of um, proportional representation, and I was actually a, a signatory of Charter 88, which was a campaign in 1988, as you might guess, for constitutional reform, including proportional representation. I followed um, over the years the debates about PR within the Labour Party. We've had the, the plant report, uh, the Jenkins report. Uh, both of those recommended that Labour should adopt a form of PR, but that didn't happen. Uh, I'm really grateful to SME for Labour uh, for hosting our discussion uh, this evening. Um, SMEs, uh, it's often claimed, are the backbone of our economy. I'm going to make a, 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 like a personal uh, statement of interest, which is that I am actually a, a sole trader myself, and I'm also the co-owner of a very small consultancy company, and I was an SME champion in government when I was a senior civil servant a few years ago. Um, SME for Labour is about strengthening the relationship between uh, small, medium and micro and uh, micro owner and family run businesses with the Labour Party, supporting constructive and informed discussion with the Labour movement on issues impacting SMEs, working closely with trade unions, employers, groups and individuals, and encouraging partnership and collaboration. Um, we organise meetings with Labour parliamentarians and others to, in order to gain a greater understanding of the challenges faced by SMEs. Um, so we have two speakers this evening. The first one I'm very pleased to introduce is Laura Parker. I think Laura may be known to many of you. Uh, Laura herself was in the civil service, both in the United Kingdom and, and in the European Commission. And she was a chief executive of children's rights organizations, spent many years living and working um, outside the uh, UK, including in Southeast Asia and Eastern Europe. Uh, before going to work in the Labour Party as private secretary to Jeremy Corbyn, uh, sorry, I got my punctuation wrong then. Uh, she also then worked as national organiser for Momentum between 2017 and 2019. Since March, she's been locked down in northern Italy with her Italian husband, where she's speaking to us from tonight, uh, where she works for Labour Campaign for a New Democracy. And she's also active in Another Europe is Possible and Labour for a European Future. I'll be introducing Mike Sutton um, after uh, Laura speaks. Um, what I should say as well is that we got a we got an hour for this meeting and what I'd like you to do if you have questions is pop them in the chat box and I'll try and pick those up after our two speakers have uh, addressed the meeting. So first of all uh, I should also say Laura Parker is a former neighbour of mine. Um, she lived just around the corner. Um, we were both members of the same Labour Party branch and obviously same constituency. So it's really nice to be able to speak to and see Laura again. So Laura, over to you. Hello, good evening. I hope you can all hear me. I've got a wonderful gadget I've acquired, which means I don't have to lean into the computer so much, but I'm generally hopeless at this whole Zoom thing. So I apologize if you're kind of looking at my left nostril. Um, Thank you for the invitation. It is lovely to see Vauxhall people and others who I've seen before. I think I last went to an SME for Labour event about three Christmases ago when I did the raffle. Um, 
I am working now for this coalition, which I'll just tell you about. I just want to say I am very much the warm up act and the main the main gig this evening is Mike, who's going to talk to you about the substantive issues around PR. But I maybe just give you an update on where this Labour campaign is and who is in it. So the Labour for a New Democracy uh, project began um, sometime last year and I in fact <laughs> was was in no way really involved with its with its setting up but it has now got 11 principal organizations supporting it some of whom are labor only organizations you many of you will have heard of the labor campaign for electoral reform which was founded a good while ago um, open labor labor for european future chartist um, which isn't sort of a labour organisation per se, but is obviously very, very closely linked to labour and the labour movement, and an organisation called Politics for the Many, which brings together trade unionists who are interested in PR. And there are another of other organisations who have sort of labour bits to them. So Compass Labour, which is part of Compass, Unlock Labour, which is part of Unlock Democracy, um, and then a couple of cross party campaigns, get PR done, the Electoral Reform Society, another Europe is possible, and make votes matter. And all of those have sort of Labour members in them and, it, and it's those people that we bring together. So the very simple aim of this coalition is in September this year, we hope to get the Labour Party to pass uh, policy on PR we are not uh, trying to persuade the party of a particular form of PR. We're quite keen, in fact, not to bury ourselves in debate about STV and thresholds and percentages here and there uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that we probably wouldn't have consensus even within our own coalition just yet. The second is that those discussions sometimes can be dominated by small numbers of people who are kind of quite expert in systems and they can become slightly exclusive and, and often not that exciting for the rest of us. But the other is because we think the Labour Party needs to make an in-principle commitment to changing the current system, which doesn't work, and Mike is going to talk about why it doesn't work, and then to have an inclusive process why, whereby we all collectively decide what sort of system we think we would like. Now, some people are very keen on having a citizens' assembly, Others would be keen on having perhaps consultations uh, within and then beyond the Labour Party. Some people might want to have uh, a survey of Labour Party members. Obviously, the Parliamentary Labour Party will have a view. However it is done, our view is that it will take some time for us to figure out exactly what system will work. We obviously have examples of PR already um, in action in the UK, in Scotland, in Wales. Uh, the Greater London Authority, which we'll be voting for in May, uh, other mayoral elections. Um, so there are some examples, but we don't want to be prescriptive at this stage. The most important thing is that conference makes an in-principle commitment, and we would like to then see that in the manifesto. We are not uh, campaigning for a referendum on PR. Many of you may be relieved to hear, because I think many of us feel we've had enough of referendums for the moment. Um, and this motion, which has been doing the rounds of constituency Labour parties, is having enormous success. We now have, as of, uh, I think it is Friday or, yeah, Friday, 193 constituency Labour parties have passed a pro-PR motion. Now, somebody with a better memory than me will probably be able to think of something which has had that much support in recent times, but not many things get that much support. Obviously, both Brexit and the Green New Deal in, in recent times have had huge interest across the membership. But as a general rule, um, it's very rare that we have a third of constituency Labour parties passing policy on one issue. So we're very pleased about that. Uh, for the next month, we will continue to push motions through CLPs. Then obviously there will be a break for the local elections. And then we'll go into the next phase of the campaign where we will be hopefully encouraging all of those CLPs to then pass a conference motion. Uh, you, you probably all 
quite active in in the Labour Party and will know that a conference motion, the wording is slightly different. There's a word limit. There's a sort of conference resolves, blah, blah, blah. But basically speaking, it will be the same general ask and in principle commitment, an inclusive process to decide what the specific policy is and then uh, a manifesto commitment. And yes, well done, Rosemary, for pointing out. I shouldn't tell people I'm no good on Zoom because no bloke would. I retract all of my own self-criticism. <laughs> However, I'm not an expert on PR. Um, from sort of May, June, the focus will be the conference motions. And also then talking to trade unions. Well, we're already talking to the trade unions. As obviously you know, at conference, any votes are 50% the party members and 50% the affiliated uh, organisations, including the trade unions and the socialist societies. And the trade unions make up 42% of that half, or of that 50%, in fact. So I guess that's 84%. Um, the trade unions are a bit of a mixed bag when it comes to PR. We might want to talk about, about why that is. At the moment, there are three of the smaller um, affiliated, there are 12 affiliated trade unions in the Labour Party, and there are three of the smaller ones who have pro-PR policy, uh, the Bakers Union, TSSA and the Musicians Union. There are a number of others which this year are discussing PR because they've had motions coming up through their own structures. Those include Unison, Unite, the GMB and ASLEF. Um, and there are a couple who have actually pro first past the post policy, Osdor and the GMB. Um, I think it would be a very brave person to suggest that all of the big unions who obviously have the greatest weighted vote at conference are going to start championing this. I think that's that's probably unlikely. But we are optimistic that then there's a possibility that some will sort of sit it out. We're obviously very keen not to have a members versus unions kind of clash um, at, at conference. Um, but as things currently stand, it's not clear how some of the bigger unions are going to approach this, in part because some of them have got general secretary elections going on at the moment in GMB and Unite. And there is a relatively recently appointed new general secretary of Unison. So there's some question marks about, about how that's going to go. Other influences obviously within the party include the National Executive Committee. That is got significant numbers of people who are very pro, including a number of the people elected by, the, uh, by we, the party membership. Um, then obviously it's got its trade union reps. And then uh, the shadow cabinet appointees and obviously the leadership um, themselves. Keir's own position in the leadership campaign, I think most objectively would be described as open. Um, obviously we on the pro PR side are trying to claim him as one of ours. Um, I, 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 think, uh, I, I think he is very persuadable um, and he has made an on the record uh, comments repeatedly, including in his leadership campaign, about the current system leaving many people behind, including those even in safe seats where people don't necessarily feel represented because it might be sort of their party winning, but they know that their vote isn't really isn't really counting. And I think he's there reflecting his own position, obviously, in Hoban and St Pancras, where he has a very significant majority. So Keir is, broadly speaking, open. Um, he has kicked off recently a constitutional commission, which is going to talk about a range of issues to do with the democratic settlement in the UK. And uh, we have heard repeatedly from people in the, in the party leadership that no issues are off the agenda. So we are hopeful that electoral reform will be part of, of that constitutional commission discussion. Um, and, you know, we obviously also hope that Keir is listening to what what the membership is saying, not just through the constituency Labour Party motions, but the last polling of the Labour Party membership just before the last election in 2019, suggested that 76% of people in Labour were pro-PR. That was done by YouGov. Um, my feeling from talking to a number of MPs um, is that 
a number are all, and I perhaps finish on this point and then leave Mike to tell you more, um, a number of MPs who've been ambivalent in the past are clearly moving. Now, something of this is probably the natural cycle of elections. There is a pattern sometimes in Labour, you know, we don't do so well in an election and our enthusiasm for PR uh, goes up for perhaps understandable reasons. But I've spoken to a number of MPs, this is part of my role, who have been, well, in some cases against PR in the past and are now quite decidedly for, and others who are more ambivalent than they have been and, and, and moving. So I think there is a shift in the Parliamentary Labour Party um, and we are optimistic that we will actually get this passed at conference. And now, the main act. <laughs> uh, Laura, thank, thank you very much indeed. And uh, can I just say brilliant use of Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. All right, so um, I'm now very pleased to, to, to introduce uh, uh, Mike Sutton. Uh, Mike, um, like myself, is a lifelong uh, Labour supporter. He's currently the chair of his branch in Suffolk Coastal CLP. He's also, interestingly enough, a member of his uh, local town, town council, where he's chair of finance. And the town council is actually run by an alliance of Labour, Lib Dem and Green councillors. Uh, he has a, a considerable and distinguished uh, career uh, in education uh, as a teacher, a head teacher. He's been one of uh, Her Majesty's inspectors of school and uh, a consultant educational advisor in both the United Kingdom and the United States. Um, he says he's now retired, but actually he also says he's busier more than ever working on many projects, including being an advisor to co the Cooperative Schools Association and a director of the Woodbridge Riverside Trust. So um, in his busy retirement, uh, Mike has kindly agreed to speak to us this evening. So Mike, grateful if you could give us your, your thoughts. I'm delighted to have this opportunity and um, thank you ever so much for the invite. I'm going to simply um, share a screen which has got some PowerPoint slides on it. I promise I'm not going to talk to them. But one thing retirement does bring is the need for visual reminders. Um, so I do need to be able to uh, see from time to time what exactly it is I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. Um, now, can you see that? There's something not quite right. We, we can see it, but you probably need to put it on slide view if you can, Mike. Yeah, um, it should be. Uh, at the moment, only the host, it says, can share. Oh, you should can... be. Yeah, we can see it. We can see it. Can see it. Um, yeah. But for some reason, it is not going to start at the first slide. Let's take that off and see if that works. No, that doesn't work. And it worked perfectly when we joined at the beginning and had a go, but there we are. Yeah. Um, Just before we started, I was saying how bad I was going to be at Zoom, but... Um, uh, and there, Laura thought she was, but she wasn't. And now, that is very strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, Mike, don't worry if you can't get it onto slide on slide show. Okay, you can. Can everybody see the slide? That's the main thing. Anyway, the, the trouble is, the next one was a warm up, and when I put the slide up, not only will it give you the question, it's going to give you all the answers because I can't make the bullets come in one at a time. Um, so, if I was to, ugh, I'll probably have to do it this way now. No, this is not working. This has gone into hibernation of some sort. So I'm going to stop sharing and have another we, go. We, Mike, we, can, we could see it, actually. It was on your warm-up slide. Well, that's interesting because I couldn't see it. <laughs> um, okay. Let me try sharing again. But every time I go for share, it keeps telling me. Just a bit of a tip. Have you got yourself on speaker view? Um, I don't think so. If you go to the top right hand corner, yeah, 
I'll, I'll, I'm, and click on speaker. Right, now. that's good now. We can only see, oh no. Yeah, oh. we've got it. We've got your warm up slide. All right, okay, let's have a look. All right, well, the trouble is that it's not responding to anything I'm doing here. Oh, that is so annoying. Let me just, let me just go out of that for a second, exit full screen, minimize you all for a second and exit there. Close that down and try again. Let's see what happens this time. So I go to there, I go share screen, I go to that. And now with a bit of luck can go to start from first slide. Hey, it is gonna work. <laughs> Sorry about that folks. There we are. That, that's who I am. Um, warm up question. What was the first year? What year was the first UK general election held under one MP per constituency under first past the post? I'm not going to ask you all to give answers. Give yourself a mental answer and see how close you get. And the answer, which is quite surprising, is 1950. And the reason? Well, until then, there were university MPs. Uh, there were 12 in the Labour uh, government of 1945. They were elected by graduates. Um, but what is really interesting is that they were elected by a type of proportional representation, the single transferable vote. And the reason, because it was deemed a fairer system, but too complex for ordinary uneducated people to understand. We move on. Um, it is now the system that's used for the Northern Irish Assembly and the Scottish local elections. Um, we move on. Our voting system, well, the Great Reform Act brought about a whole load of changes and a whole load of things that we now consider to be manifestly wrong or unfair. All of these were allowed. Um, under various uh, reform acts. And bit by bit, we have got rid of all the things that were just completely unfair and wrong. And there's one left. And that is to get rid of the, the final unfair element of our system, which is first past the post. So, if we then sort of say, well, well, what's wrong with this system we've got? Well, the first thing that's wrong about it is that seats very rarely match votes cast. Since the war, no governing party has ever had more than 50% of, um, of the vote, of the popular vote. It's worse than that from 1970 because no governing party has ever had more than 45% of the vote. And in five out of 12 of the elections since 1970, that's almost half the elections in living memory, um, the governing party has had less than 40% of the vote. So in every election since the war, more than half the people did not vote for that government. And I emphasize that it is of the voters and that is not the same as the electorate. And that is another thing I'll come to a little later on. Um, we waste votes. <laughs> I started my, um, my voting career in 1970. Um, and I voted in every election since. And not one of my votes has ever counted for anything. I, I, I started my voting career in Liverpool in one of the safest Labour seats, where it really didn't matter whether I voted or not. Me too. After 12 years, I moved to Suffolk Coastal, which happens to be the second safest Conservative seat, where my vote counts not one jot. Um, I would dearly love to go to my grave having had my vote count for something at some time or other. But seriously, when you've got Labour safe seats, and for the same matter, when you've got conservative safe seats, 
people who don't vote for those safe parties, their vote counts for nothing. Um, also, people who do vote for them, you end up with a huge surplus of votes. And those votes really don't count for anything either. So you've got a, a complete mismatch here. Um, for small parties, there is a huge dilemma. If you take the, well, the Liberal Democrats, the Greens, Clyde Cymru and so on, um, if people go to the polling booth, they are faced, as a, a Green supporter or Plaid Cymru supporter, they're faced with a real dilemma. Do I vote for the party that I believe in and the, hopefully the candidate I believe in, knowing that they have got very little chance of uh, any representation under this system, or do I vote for my next or my next least um, despicable candidate or whatever? And so you end up with this sort of uh, dishonesty within the polling, the self-dishonesty that many people are faced with. Um, first past the post really focuses down on a small number of seats. You've all heard of the, the Red Wall and so on, and you can bet your life that both of the big parties are now very much focused on those 40 or 50 constituencies as being the key ones for turning the election round or holding on or whatever it is. If you think back to the recent American presidential election, which is another first past the post system, um, it all boiled down to what they call the handful of swing states. The millions of extra Democrat votes in California or the millions of extra Republican votes in what Tennessee or somewhere counted for nothing. They just go into this popular vote pile that doesn't actually produce anything. So we have a system that wastes people's votes and people feel those votes are wasted and that has another impact later on. Playing field isn't level. Well, it, it treats parties unequally because it doesn't matter how many votes are cast, it's where they're cast that really produces the results. So as I said, you can, you can have lots of votes cast for Labour in places like Liverpool. And other constituencies, like the nearest one to me would be somewhere like Ipswich, which is always a marginal constituency, literally a few hundred votes can make all the difference between one party and another. Big parties tend to do well under first past the vote, uh, first past the post. And by big parties, I don't just mean the two big beasts, but I mean the, the Scottish Nationalist Party are effectively a big party within, uh, within their own region, like the DUP are a big, big party within its region of Northern Ireland. Nobody stands for uh, SNP or DUP um, outside of those regions. And they tend to do well under first-past-the-post systems. Um, small parties fare very, very poorly. Um, and the inequity is transparent if you look at some of the anomalies. For example, in 2015, um, UKIP polled 4 million votes. The Scottish Nationalist Party polled 1.5 million votes. UKIP got one MP, the Scottish Nationalist got 56. Now, I've got no time whatsoever for UKIP. But if four million people put their vote against that party and they got one representative, something is very wrong. Another example, the Liberal Democrat, um, um, they, they got 13 times as many votes as the DUP, um, but they both end up with eight seats. There is something very unfair about this, and that unfairness translates itself into um, people apathy, I think, which I'll come to in a, in a minute. Uh, it messes up politics. For example, there are times when parties split. You can go way back into the 19th century and there were party splits going on then. It happens now. It happened in the 1980s, for those of you that like me that can remember the angst of Labour splitting and the, the SDLB for me. Um, the result was that a lot of Labour votes went with the SDLP and we had a fragmented party. And 
Labour was out of power for the best part of 15 years after that, that split. The, to the Tories had to fight tooth and nail to avoid a split over Brexit within their own party, because they knew that if that happened, then they were probably sunk as a, as a Conservative party. And they, they just about held it together in a way that, that Labour hasn't in the past. So splits that are that would be right and proper if policies have gone in different directions are just not feasible under first past the post. Um, it tends to lead to political decisions being made that are based on pragmatic self-survival rather than national interest. And I think much of what went on around Brexit, whichever side of the fence you're on for that, was about pragmatic survival rather than about um, what was actually right. Uh, there's lots of evidence around the world that first past the post favours a more right-wing agenda. Um, in America, for example, where it's not just the president, but at, at um, a congressional and Senate level, um, first past the post is largely used. There are some, um, some variations in places. But those two houses tend to be right wing. It's very unusual for the Democrats to have control of both houses. Um, it's certainly true in this country that we've had right wing, let's say center right wing parties ruling this country for something like two thirds of the time since the Second World War, perhaps a bit more than that. It can lead to apathy, and it's interesting. I did a little bit of research and some adding up and some um, and playing with numbers, and, and this is what you get. I looked at the 18 or so elections that there have been since the Second World War. In the 1950s, the average percentage turnout, the turnout vote, was around 80%. In fact, you know, for the, it was up at about 85% for the 1950 election. Um, in the 60s, 70s, right through to the 90s, it bounced around between the 70s and 80s. It never went below 70%, it never went above 80. But look what's happened since 2000. We have never had a general election where 70, more than 70% of the electorate had turned out. And in one, and I think that was Tony Blair's second election, it was actually only 59%. There's, there's some real anxiety for me in that because that really is indicative of people not engaging with politics and nothing can be unhealthier for a, 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 for a country than for its population to be disengaged with the political process. I think it also has other subliminal effects. I think that if people aren't engaged with the process, then politicians feel less under scrutiny and more inclined to go their own way and do things that we would rather them not do. We don't compare particularly well with other countries. Of the 44 Western European countries, in terms of turnout at general elections, we're halfway down the list. And if you look at the EU member states, we're not a member, but if you look at that, we're in the lowest third. Um, countries with PR tend to have higher turnout of election, better public engagement with the electoral process. There have been something like, something like 50 countries, I think, have come into existence in the last 100 years. Not one of those has opted for first past the post as its preferred electoral system. So, what if we had PR? We would probably have more honest politics. No more, and I'm sure you've all heard this or seen it on leaflets, vote for this party. No other party has a chance around here. Um, everybody could actually vote for a party they support, knowing that to some extent, greater or smaller, their vote would count. Um, and of course, how well it counts depends on the system, but we're not going into that now. 
So everybody's vote does have meaning, and that is really, really important for democracy. Much more important that you end up with a government that the majority of people voted for. It may not have been all for the same party, but it is certainly, um, you end up with governments that have 50, 60, 70% of the, um, of the uh, electorate that who vote. And I'm just going to backtrack a little because what I was saying about turnout is important. In the last election, it was just over two thirds of the electorate that voted. And the Conservatives got, I think, about 45% of the vote. So they actually got 42 thirds of 45% of the electorate voting for them. Only a third of the people entitled to vote in this country actually voted for the government we have now. And I think that is a very worrying sign. Um, it's interesting that sister countries with PR, that there is evidence that you get better representation for women and minority groups. One of the problems about first past the post is that around 15% of the, elect the potential electorate do not register to vote. And that's very often the uh, those who are most disenfranchised in society in all sorts of ways. They are in the poorer regions, they tend to be ethnic minorities, they tend to be um, people that have got many problems in their lives. And they are the ones who get underrepresented by the system. Uh, parties who campaign fairly and honestly, that's a nice thought, isn't it? Because you would not have to attack those parties that you thought were um, more likely to win than you, because you could actually be honest knowing that the system was not based on simply who got most votes on a particular day, that it would be based on some other proportionate measure. Um, you actually get fewer extremist governments. And it's interesting that um, if you look at Germany, after the First World War, it introduced a system of proportional representation and people say, yeah, it didn't stop Hitler coming to power. It actually did, because in 1933, the Nazi party only got 33% of the vote because of the proportional representation system. And it was that that triggered um, their storming of the Reichstag and their banning of opposition parties and all the rest of it. It was not an elections, an electoral system that brought them to power. In fact, it kept them out. Um, I'll just very quickly go through some of the pushback questions you get about PR. Um, produces strong, stable governments, and wouldn't we have endless coalitions. Hmm. Well, I did some more trawling. In the last hundred years, a third of governments have either been some form of cross-party coalition or a minority government or a confidence and supply. Or what was the one in 74? Was it called the social contract or compact? A little cross-party. So it is not unusual to have governments that are cross-party. We've had the last four elections. Um, but what's interesting is that the coalitions formed under the current system are coalitions that are brought about by failure. It's because one party has failed to get an, an absolute majority, that it starts casting around and looking for partners. We saw this in 2010, how long, I was working in America at the time and I kept coming home each day to find out whether there was a government at home or not. And I think it took the best part of a week with the Liberal Democrats talking to Labour, then talking to Conservatives, Labour, and in, in the end, falling down, falling into bed with one particular party. Um, I would not say that the way that Theresa May's last government um, was a particularly strong, stable or honest government, the way it went into power with the DUP. Um, 
it was um it, it simply was not a, not a good system in that sense so there is no evidence that uh, 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 br produces anything worse in fact quite the opposite if you look at most of europe most countries use some form of br system and when you start looking at countries like like denmark and sweden and so on you don't hear about endless coalitions and breakups and all the rest of it. And it's funny, the one country that gets quoted, and I think quite, quite wrongly in many respects, is Italy. But the next time that's quoted is you as an example of how you get lots and lots of different governments, ask them for another example. There aren't many. In fact, most of them are very stable. Would it really win us an election? Well, I'm not going to go there. There's lots of questions about that. Um, and again, if you want a socialist transformation in society, well, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to get at least a centre-left government elected. Um, aren't they incredibly complicated? Well, they thought so in 19, up to 1950 about the university system. But in fact, what have we got? We've got... Um, Single transferable vote is used for Scottish elections and the Northern Irish um, Assembly. The additional member system is used in, um, the, in the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Assembly. Um, and it's incidentally, it was also the one that was opted for by New Zealand, which was the last country that switched from first past the post to proportional representation. We've got supplementary vote used for UK mayors and police and crime commissioners. So we've got three forms of a type of PR in, 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 in existence already. Yes, there was an education job to be done about how that voting system worked, but once people got the hang of it, they, they just take it in their stride. So no, it is not too complicated. Well, didn't we have a referendum in 2011? No, we did not have a referendum on PR. We were asked a question about one system whether we wanted that or not. And if you thought it was an unfair, flawed, you'd probably vote no. So it was not a referendum on PR. It was a, it was a simple referendum on whether you wanted one type of system to replace what we had. And it was quite unfair. And I think even the Liberal Democrats now would admit that they were hoodwinked into, into going for that. Well, we've always had it, why should we change? Well, you get this trotted out, it served us well, what you know, stood the test of time. Well, the same was true about probably burning heretics at the, at, at the stake at one time. Tried and tested, I'm sure it was. It went on for far too long. But just because something has been in existence for a long time does not mean that it is good or it is right. That is, it give disproportionate powers to small parties? Well, it depends on the system you go for and the thresholds and all the rest of it. It doesn't have to. Right. I've looked at my watch. That was a bit long. Um, I'm going to stop there. I could go on. I'm going to flip through and just suggest that if people want to look at different systems, go to the Electoral Reform Society. I found that really useful because it gives you all the single, the, the different systems. It also gives you an indication as to what their strengths are. None is perfect. Some are more perfect than others. And they've all got flaws, but they are all better than what we've got at the moment. And I think the one that really tickles me is one called the border count. And where is it used? It's used in two very small countries. And it was used for the Eurovision Song Contest. Um, <laughs> it has merit, but not a lot. Um, null point, I think, is probably what we get for that. OK, I'm going to stop there, if that's all right, Simon. Thank you, Mike. That's lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thanks for taking us through that. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask one or two questions myself and then uh, if people would like to put questions in the chat, we will have a look at that and see if there are any there. But also there's a facility for you to raise your hand electronically. At the bottom of the screen, you can see a raise hand button. So if you'd rather just ask your question verbally uh, and on camera, if you've got your camera on, well, I'm happy to take those questions as well. 
But what I want to start with really, and I'm not sure um, which of you want to, to address this, is that um, actually, I referred to this earlier on, Labour have kind of been um, discussing PR for quite a long time. And we had two, we had, I think the Plant Commission, Professor Plant um, under uh, Neil Kinnock when he was leader. And then um, when Tony Blair became prime minister, he commissioned Roy Jenkins um, to produce a report. Both recommended adopting PR, neither happened. Um, obviously I'm quite biased about Roy Jenkins because he refused to speak to me at a party years ago, but there you go. Um, <laughs> so my point is we've looked at this a couple of times and it hasn't quite happened. How do you, how do um, either of you think we can make a difference this time? Um, I, one of the things I think about the Jenkins report, it was the, in a sense, the right report at the wrong time. Um, any, any government with a majority of 179, which is what Tony Blair's had, probably doesn't feel the need to change an electoral system anytime soon. You, the, the worst that most parties do is lose 60, 70 seats per election if they've got a big majority. He knew he was there for three terms. Um, was the, Je the Jenkins um, uh, alternative vote AV plus, I think it was called. Um, it wasn't a perfect system, but it was a lot better than what we've got now. And it could have been, it could have been adjusted. Adopted what, what was suggested, but again, they never did. Um, but I, I, I think the honest answer has to be that it has to be, it has to be based on argument and what is fair. We cannot, as a Labour Party, purport to be a party of honesty and fairness, but quite happy to be elected by a system that is manifestly neither. Yes, and I, I obviously agree with that. And thanks, Mike. It was really interesting. I took lots of notes in your presentation. Um, I think there's also something about the way that uh, younger generations, and I'm saying this as someone who clearly isn't that young, um, but I think there is something different about the way that people are making their political choices now. The world is a lot less binary. Um, I am old enough to remember growing up in a household which watched BBC One and read The Guardian and knew that the news was um, on at six or at 10. When I worked at Momentum and my colleagues were in their early 20s, everything about the way they lived their life was just incredibly different. The array of the bewildering, I think quite stressful array of choice that most young people have. They certainly didn't just read one publication. They didn't just watch one TV. If they watched the news, they could watch it when they liked. Everything about their life is more complex, including the choices they make about their politics. And we cannot assume that this tribal attachment to one of the two big beasts will just continue. Now at the moment, of course, Labour does continuously and significantly and consistently do better with young people um, than other parties. Um, but uh, we, we also know that some of the issues which are really driving young people are almost transcending uh, party divides. Um, if you look at the last week, you know, the women who took to Clapham Common, many of them will have been from Vauxhall CLP, but they won't all have been in the Labour Party. The Black Lives Matter campaign, the crisis climate, you know, to, to resolve any of these issues, uh, we have to build the broadest of coalitions and bring with us lots of young people in particular who are not in the Labour Party. And th there is an understanding amongst younger people about the need to to build more uh, coalitions, to have a more fluid approach to politics, and, and honestly, a system that was created at the back end of the, not even just the last century, but the one before it, doesn't feel fit for purpose for, more, for, for many people. I agree with Mike's point as well, that the Labour Party, you know, one of the arguments we're making in the PR campaign is that the Labour Party has to rediscover its fundamental values. And one of those is about the basics of democracy and fairness. It is not sustainable that we can have a great view on the NHS and we're better on anti-austerity. And, you know, uh, we've got greater respect for the fire service, but somehow we don't count, care about whether your vote counts or not. And that just feels archaic, I think. And in this world of not only bewildering choice, but also very direct democracy, you know, what do I, who do I want to win Britain's Got Talent? Um, 
which of the 17 people offering energy services am I going to pick? You know, it, it's just not sustainable to cling on to this system, which deprives people of choice. It's, it's out of kilter with the times. Um, I also think um, with Scotland and a couple of people, I think, um, have mentioned this, uh, you know, if, if we end up in a situation in which uh, there's another referendum and, you know, Scotland becomes independent, we would need 90 seats for Labour to be able to win and form a government. We've got to get real about the prospects of this happening. And indeed, to the point about the next election, and of course I agree with Mike, we don't want an endless discussion about whether we can win it or not, but I personally believe that one of the ways to winning it, we have to win it under the current system, is to make some significant uh, gestures and more than just a gesture to the other parties about how we would intend to then govern and it's absolutely clear to me and we saw this with the with the anti-brexit campaign last time around that if there's not a significant gesture of good faith from the Labour Party some people will just vote green or they will just vote Lib Dem and we will be stuck with the Tories again one of the biggest things that the Labour Party can do to signal a different way of wanting to govern for the progressive majority and I know as Labour people were very tribal about Labour being the only progressive party, but I think we have to be honest that, you know, progressive is a big word and, it, and it's not just the Labour parties. One of the things we have to do as a signal of serious intent to those other parties is commit to PR. Then they might help us get over the line. We put it in our manifesto. And then, yes, we will have coalitions after that, including the Lib Dems and the Greens. But I would take a coalition with those get guys any day of the week over so, another 20 years of Tories and I think that's the argument for the Labour Party. Thank you Laura. There's some, there's some questions coming in on the chat so I'm going to uh, read a few of them out. Um, so uh, Rosemary is asking about the, the, the Tories wanting to mandate voter ID um, which uh, in the United States is being used as, as, as voter suppression. Is, is that relevant in any way to PR. Um, uh, Teresa is asking about um, how can producing a plethora of small parties be avoided? Um, that was what made the system weak in 1920s Germany. And um, also, and I think you've touched on it slightly already, Laura, but do we need to adopt PR as the basis for an electoral pact to win the next general election? Mm. So either of you want to start on that, Mike, uh, or maybe? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to go, well, what was the first question? I'm, I'm, my memory now copes with two at a time. Yeah, <laughs> on, voter, on voter ID, whilst Mike is remembering the question. Yeah, it's, I think this is all part of the, the, the whole thing that, of dishonesty that, that embraces first past the post, because um, there are there are lots of little subtle dishonesties dishonesties going on. If you think about it, first past the post is the only electoral system really that lends itself to gerrymandering. Um, you you can you can you can fix your borders for your constituencies because that, it's the constituencies that elect your MPs. If you have a different system, a list system, a regional system, it's much harder to to, to fill. Um, and again, anything that suppresses voter registration, if, if you think about uh, the, the part that the, the group of society that Labour and for that matter, the Greens and Liberal Democrats tend to represent, it tends to be those who are not as, uh, tends, not all, not entirely, to be as wealthy or as privileged or, or whatever. Those who uh, either don't have the wherewithal to, to get that part of registration, and some who prefer to fly below the, 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 um, uh, the parapet and don't want to be on different sorts of systems. It's, it's dressed up as security, and it is little more than what um, Donald Trump wants in America, to suppress the vote of those people who won't vote for him. All right, Mike, thank you for that. Um, oh, Laura, can you cover the other two? And then I've got a question, somebody raising a hand. Yeah. So Oh, so on the plethora of small parties, it's a really interesting question. I am not a sort of systems expert, but there are mechanisms you can introduce, um, in, including, for example, thresholds. So, you know, you in, in a top up list 
Um, you know, th there's all sorts of ways that you can construct a system um, so that you avoid having infinite numbers of parties. Um, but I would also say, and I think this was touched on, upon before, that in a way, the, the Labour Party has just built its coalition in advance of the election. And there may be other realignments that will be made in British politics. And I think we just have to <laughs> relax slightly about some of them. Um, so, you know, you could have seen around the last election that there were broad swathes of people who had very united views about Brexit, which cuts across numbers of parties. Um, and then there were divisions within the Labour Party about Brexit, never more than probably about 20%, but about 20% of the Labour Party membership were pro Brexit. So we're just building our coalition in advance, which doesn't make life any harder, but it doesn't make it any easier either. I would also say there's something about the cultural shift that comes with politics where you have coalition building. I worked for the European Commission and I was always struck um, how, you know, we'd come out of meetings and the commission would say, some commission representative would say, oh, that was great, we reached a compromise. And a compromise position is a thing in the EU. It's literally called a compromise position. And it's basically the thing that everybody's aiming for. Like that it's a sign of a great success if you manage to get, you know, 27, sadly, now member states to agree on something. And, and it changes the way that people interact. Now, one of the charges then made, particularly by people from the left, um, is well, you know, you lose your opportunity for radicalism. But in many ways, you gain an opportunity for radicalism because your parties are not having to chase after a small minority of voters in a small number of marginal seats. So set against the fact that you might have more parties, well, you may, more people will feel represented by them, but you may have opportunities for building different coalitions around things like climate and also for having some more radicalism and not being dragged down to the lowest common denominator politics of the 50 seats that actually make a difference. Um, on the final point about electoral pacts, I think that, um, just to be very clear, that Labour for New Democracy is supporting PR. It is not taking a sort of line on a progressive alliance. Um, but yes, um, it, it may lead to um, electoral pacts or, of some sort. Um, but it, it may actually work in the other direction because people know there will be a negotiation once the election has been happened because they know more parties will be represented and they will fight their corner within the context of that negotiation. More fundamental, I think, to me as a Labour Party member and as a socialist is thinking about not what it necessarily means just for parties, but what it means for individual members of the public. And Mike made this point, I thought, very compellingly. Um, you know, where people don't feel represented, you have apathy. And that graph he showed us with the drop off in turnout, I think, says it all. But I also think that one of the reasons we've been in such a mess for the last few years is because three million people voted in the Brexit referendum and good for them for turning out. And they have clung like fury to the result of that because they finally felt their vote counted. Now, how many of those people that Labour lost to UKIP and you know, then got caught up in this swirl of the last four tortuous years, we might have actually got back if in 2010 or 2015 they'd had a UKIP MP who would have turned out to be utterly dreadful, who would have been a hopeless constituency MP, who would have had a very small number of people in parliament. We'd have got some of those people back you know, this system is creating apathy and apathy serves the right. <laughs> and we on the, on, on, on the left and the centre left or whichever bit of, of the labour world we're in, like we know that. So, it's, so I think we should be thinking much more about what this would do for individual electors and their sense of engagement and commitment with politics if we change the system. And that would help us because engagement helps the left because we are doing a much better job of representing what the real people of this country need than the current shower. All right, thank you, Laura. Um, I was about to unmute Patrick, but I think his hand's gone down. Ah, uh, oh, there you are, Patrick. Let me just try and unmute you if I can. Um, I'm trying to do that, but I don't know. 
If I was could just jump in just to add one thing to to what Laurel was saying. Um, if if Labour want to make um, a, a real success of this, and, and yes, there are going to have to be electoral tax. That's a whole different meeting to talk about that. Um, but one of the things I think that electoral reform should be about, or it shouldn't just be about the voting system. It should be about voting age. I work with, um, uh, uh, as a town councillor, I work with the Youth Assembly, um, and they're mainly 15 to, to 18 year olds, and they are knowledgeable, articulate, in a way that probably many 60 or 70 year olds aren't. And at 16, they should have the vote. There's no doubt about that. So I think there's that aspect of voting reform. There's the whole aspect of the, 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 the second chamber, the, the House of Lords, which is um, still an old boys network effectively. You, you, you just get given it for doing good, good things. Um, it is about as undemocratic as it could possibly be. So I would like to see Labour put together a much broader electoral reform package um, in terms of its um, right. manifesto than just I think yeah. we better just bring in two two last questioners because um, we're slightly over time. So I'm going to ask Patrick to ask his question, and then I'm going to go to David for his question. So Patrick, I think you're unmuted now. Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm a politics student at uh, Edinburgh University and a Labour Party member, obviously by being here. And when we study uh, first past the post systems, there is a very strong case made, known as Divergier's Law that suggests that first past the post systems lead to two opposite opposing parties. But more importantly than that, they make the two strong parties incorporate a broad church inside them. So, they, so instead of having many, many small parties, everybody understands that only the two parties have any real chance of winning. And therefore parties like our own benefit very strongly by being the obvious opposition, where we're not in Scotland where I live, unfortunately. So there is a very strong effect of first past the post system in driving our own party, as we currently see today, driving us back to the center, because we realize that we need to capture many of these groups that Laura has mentioned. Though there is the sacrifice of the representation, there is a very positive effect to the politics of the country if you look at it in a neutral way. So it's not very as cleanly black and white as we've heard tonight. Thanks very much indeed, Patrick. I think I've managed to unmute you, David. Yep. Uh, hi. Um, one thing I would say just about other electoral reform and constitutional reform, I think it's very much a single issue. Don't get sidetracked. It's the principle of PR. And don't get sidetracked with House of Lords, uh, voting, anything else, because we'll get hammered. Uh, by the press when because it'll be the press the right-wing press will say oh it's too complicated the electorate can't understand it all that and then you throw house of lords in and everything else and it will be the whole uh, focus will be dissipated it's the foundation it, i don't think people realize how historic it would be i mean this is absolutely fundamental to the future of politics so i think single issue and just focus don't get sidetracked the same as on as uh, Laura was saying on the uh, on the systems as well. Yeah, that can be decided elsewhere. It's the principle, and let's get that then far more exposure. And I was actually just linking it also, thinking about how can we is PR attractive to business? I, I suspect the small SME SMEs would be more open because they're more like sort of us, as it were. The old, yeah, the people in the people in the street. Big business, they don't really give a monkey's who's in power because they've got so much power, they'll just, you know, bend, bend with sort of, if it's a bit left, it's a bit right. They're gonna, they're just interested in in you know their big business so they've got the power. So I would I would imagine SMEs are probably um, and of course there's far more of them, as it were, um, uh, who will be interested in PR and and in discussing the proposition. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed, uh, David. I'm going to have to make that the, the right, the last question rather. So, um, so um, Laura and, and Mike, do you want to give a, a, a one minute uh, response to, to the points uh, and questions raised by David and uh, 
Patrick. So, uh, Mike. Uh, yeah, bit, uh, I, I take your point, David. And um, who is it from Edinburgh? I, I, Patrick. They, they keep moving around. <laughs> Patrick. Yeah, Patrick. And that's, that's an interesting piece of research. The, the one thing that I would say to, to Patrick is that um, to the left of centre, you've got a number of parties with the Greens, um, Liberal Democrats, Mike Gumry and so on. There's not, there's not the same small number on the other side. They've already absorbed them. Um, yeah, it's an interesting point. Can we persuade them all to vote Labour? I, I, I don't know. I think what we need to do is to persuade them to vote for something. Um, and, and, and PR is the, is the way forward, as far as I can see. Um, oh. All right, thank you, Patrick. Uh, Laura? Yes, I quick answer to David Westwood's point. I completely agree with you. I think we shouldn't be sidetracked. I think there are lots of people who oppose PR who would like to talk about anything but. Um, but there are also people who've got lots of great ideas about votes at 16, about votes of people living abroad, uh, House of Lords reform. I probably agree with all of them. But at the heart of our democratic system is the House of Commons. All of those other things hinge upon us getting people who represent the country in the Commons. And I think, you know, if we can sort the cake out, why start with the icing? Um, which is what much of the rest of it is. Um, in terms of the other question, look, Patrick, I agree with you. Like, no system is perfect. And, you know, with a pro PR campaign, so it does sound a little bit sort of black and white. But just, just three points. There's a system bias in favour of the Tories in the current system because, you know, Diane Abbott has got a majority of 35,000. Now, I don't like the framing that people who vote for Diane Abbott, their vote sort of doesn't matter because I think the act of voting matters. But the truth is those most of those votes, you know, many of those votes don't actually count because you can live in Hackney for the rest of your days and you're never going to get anyone other than Diane Abbott. Now, I like Diane Abbott, so that's fine by me. But, you know, people are winning seats in the Tory shires and in other parts of the country, including many of the ones that we just lost, with very, very small margins. So there is a bias because we're stacking them up in urban areas, basically. Um, and my, my sort of second point coming from that is that not only are we stacking the votes up, but we're having to chase the politics of the marginal seats. So if you remember at the last election, it was Workington Man. And about 10 years before that, it was Mondeo Man. And these were these sort of mythical creatures who inhabited, you know, these small seats that we needed to win. Well, I want to live in a world in which Wandsworth Road Woman counts. Now, Wandsworth Road Woman is probably black. She's possibly working class. She may be a single mum and she may have three jobs. She's probably doing a night shift at the moment covered in PPE and she doesn't, her vote doesn't count. You know, I want a politics that because her vote counts and because politicians have to chase every member of the electorate, they also think about ones with road woman occasionally and not just, you know, Cone Valley or, or Bolton Northwest and the people who just, just left us. Um, and the third thing, I think, to, to your point, Patrick, is we end up with these two big beasts. They coexist, particularly on our side of the house, in a rather unhappy way. But also, look at what we've got. I mean, I, I will try anything to get rid of this lot. They are decimating our public services. We've got over 100,000 people dead due to COVID. It's the worst record in the world per capita. You know, we have a racist prime minister. We've just seen the mess they've made of last week's. I will try anything, anything, better campaigning, better digital, in expanding the party, thinking more imaginative about climate change, and yes, changing the voting system, because we cannot continue with this lot. They will destroy the country. And it is first past the post that has led us to the mess that we are currently in. Um, there is nothing set in stone about this. You know, we can always change it back again. But honestly, uh, I, I can't be persuaded that this is the best that we can have for Britain. And, and that, for me, is one of the fundamental reasons that we should also change the voting system. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Laura, and a very strong point for us to finish there this evening. Um, 
Thank you to you, Laura. Thank you very much indeed to, to Mike. Thanks both for oh, participating. Nice. Yeah. And thank you very much indeed to everybody who's um, uh, tuned in this evening to watch and listen. Thanks to everyone for their questions. Uh, and also I want to pay a particular thanks to Buse and the team uh, from SME for Labour for agreeing to host our discussion this evening. And I'm going to finish with a final plug. There are plenty of more SME for Labour events coming up. So if you follow SME for Labour on Twitter or uh, look to the website, plenty coming up. I want to say a particular word about the SME for Labour Gala Dinner and Labour Excellence Awards, which is, I think is going to be on the 8th of November this year. It's normally a brilliant and fun occasion and usually attended by some top guests, of course, Laura, <laughs> top guests. Uh, plus, um, we normally get the leader of the Labour Party, shadow cabinet members. Um, Sadiq Khan uh, normally comes along. So it's normally a fantastic event and it raises uh, funds to support the operations of SME for Labour. So uh, if you're interested in that, take a look at our website, take a look at our Twitter account. Or if you know Ibrahim Dugash, who, who's, uh, as I say, our co-chair, please contact Ibrahim. He's particularly happy to talk to the people who want to sponsor 10 person tables. So hope to see you at many more SME for Labour events. Best of luck to Labour for a new democracy and see you all again soon, I hope. Thank you very much indeed. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good night, Thank everyone. You. Night, night.